I know what it's like to um, feel lonely, but I don't feel any of that right here. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel depressed. I don't feel any of that here. I know what it's like to feel sick and broken and to be without hope in this world and without purpose and without peace. I don't feel any of that here. I also know what it's like to feel high. I know what it's like to feel intoxicated. I know what it's like to feel like I'm under some influence out of my control. I feel a little bit of that here. Not in a bad way, because I know that, you know, that things can be abused when used incorrectly. But God's presence heals us all. And God's presence fixes everything that's broken in our lives. I want to share a few words with you that God gave me. And we're going to go rapid speed, so rapido for those that don't speak English. Um, but uh, we're going to go through some scriptures and some points. I want to talk to you really for a few moments about the seven miracles of forgiveness. The seven miracles of forgiveness. Because I think the greatest gift that God gives us when Jesus came to this earth is the gift of forgiveness. And it's not, I'm not here to badger you about how you need to forgive other people. I'm not one of those kinds of speakers or preachers. I don't look at life that way. I think forgiving people is really easy when you have forgiven yourself. I think forgiving yourself is really hard, and forgiving people is really hard, but forgiving others is easy when you forgive yourself, but forgiving yourself is hard until you know how much God's forgiven you. And when you know how much God has forgiven you, then you can forgive yourself, and then it's so easy to forgive others. We should not even try to forgive others before we forgive ourselves. I'm saying if you have unforgiveness towards anybody, you should forgive them, but you should realize that it'll be a futile attempt to forgive others until you have forgiven yourself, and it will be a futile attempt to forgive yourself until you realize that God forgave you before you ever did anything. God forgave you before you even thought anything. God forgave you before the foundation of the world because that's when the Lamb of God was slain, before the foundation of the world. Can anybody say amen? amen. At the end of the service, in a few moments, we're going to have our moment of prayer for everybody who's believing for a miracle. This is our Christmas morning miracle service, and I want to welcome you. And, and, and you forgive me if I don't seem cheery. I'm very, like, under the influence of God's love and His grace, and I could just cry the whole service. Not because I'm sad, but because I'm so thankful for what Jesus has done in my life. I'm so thankful for the mercy he's had towards me. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for his love. So at the end of the service, we're going to, we're going to, but we're going to get pumped up. Don't worry, I'm going to get there. I'm going to warm up here. I'm going to get anointed. I think, I, you know, the anointing is already here, but I'll step into it. But I, I really want you to, to receive from God today and expect your miracle and think about what miracle it is that you're believing for. And maybe it's several things. And then you're going to have an opportunity at the end of the service, as we always do every year, to write down your miracle prayer request on an envelope, which is a special envelope that we have designed for our Christmas miracle service, and to sow an offering, to give an offering of love and an offering of faith for what Jesus has given to you. In other words, if you believe that he is all that he says he is, then we're going to have an opportunity to give him a miracle gift back of uh, the greatest, gener most generous that you can be. I want to encourage you to be that. Those of you watching online, you'll have an opportunity to do that as well. But I don't want you to do that if you don't feel grateful. I don't want you, I don't want you to do that to buy a miracle because miracles are not for sale. Miracles are gifts. 
The gift, the Bible says, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the gift of miracles. But one of the ways that we access those miracles is through the power of forgiveness. And so I want to talk to you about that a little. Is that all right? And let's look at Matthew chapter 1 and um, Matthew chapter 1. And we'll go through some things today. I'm sorry, I, I've got six pages of notes and 25 minutes to go over them. So if I go really fast, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't get too mad. But um, let, me, let me just start out with, uh, you know, this great, you know, everybody has, a, everybody has at least one great relative, don't they? Does anybody know of one good relative, one really great relative that you have? Everybody has one great relative. So I thought I'd tell, tell you this story about this great relative because uh, little Billy got a really great gift from his uncle one time and he said, thanks for the electric guitar that you gave me for Christmas, little Billy said to the uncle uh, the first time he saw him after the holidays. It's the best present I've ever received, this electric guitar and the amplifier that goes with it. That's great to hear, said the uncle. I bet you've gotten really good at playing it. Oh, I don't play it, little Billy said to his uncle. He said, my mom gives me a dollar a day not to play it during the day, and my dad gives me $5 a week not to play it at night. Thank you for this awesome, <laughs> awesome gift that keeps on giving. How many, would, how many would like an uncle like that? How many would like a, really, that kid's pretty smart, actually, more so than, um, than, the, um, than the uncle. But uh, <laughs> all right, let's go on. I tried. Um, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she will bear a son and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Oh, there's something about that name. Can anybody say amen to that? You shall bear a child and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why shall you call his name Jesus? For he will save his people from their sins. This is what we celebrate today. We celebrate that this Jesus has come to save us from our sins. And before you go on thinking, oh man, I'm struggling because I'm still sinning and I'm still falling and I'm still stumbling, so he hasn't really saved me from my sins. Oh yes, he has. You just don't realize it yet. He has saved you from all of your sins. He has forgiven you from all of your sins. When he, as soon as he showed up, as soon as he died, as soon as he showed up, as soon as he was raised up, all of your sins were washed away from now into eternity. Every sin that you've ever committed in the past that you don't even remember, remember and all of the sins that you'll ever commit in the future. Now you might think, don't tell people that because if you tell people that even their future sins are forgiven, then they'll keep sinning. But you know what? Every sin you ever committed was a future sin to God because he paid for it 2,000 years ago. So it all were future, all of them were future sins. But the Bible says that when we understand his grace and when we come to the knowledge of his love, it's not sin is no longer have any power over us, but we're not going to want to do it because we're so in love with him that we don't want to do the things that he already paid for us to not have to be in bondage to anymore. Can, can anybody say amen to that? Well, I got to tell you, this goes along with the great verse I love in John chapter 1, verse 29, when Jesus shows up. And the next day it says that John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, he was the Lamb of God before he was even on the cross. And he was, and he was in the process of taking away the sin of the world as soon as he showed up, that's what he came to do. He came to save us from our sins. And let me tell you why that's so important. It's not because sin will kill you, because just Adam's sin will kill you. Adam's sin condemns every one of us to death. So it's not just that our sins will kill us, and that's why Jesus, um, that's why Jesus forgives us and comes to save us from our sins. It's not just that he doesn't want us to go to hell, although that's true that him saving us from our sins saves us from hell. It's not just that he wants us to go to heaven, although it's true that our sins, once washed away, will, will be ushered into heaven because we've been forgiven of our sins. And you're, you, you don't get forgiven after you apologize. You're already forgiven the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, okay? You need to understand that, and we'll, we, can, we can talk more about that when we have more time. But... Um, 
But the biggest reason is found in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. And I think I have the scripture right, but it just came to my heart. The biggest reason Jesus came to forgive us of our sins, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Verse 2, look at, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. This is why. This is the the royal reason. This is the ultimate. This is the apex. This is the, the climax of it all. This is the, the center of it all. This is the greatest reason among all reasons that he saves us from our sins, that he forgives us from all of our sin. This is the greatest reason of all because our iniquities separated us from God and our sins hidden his, hidden, hid his face from us so that he will not hear but I got good news for you. The Lamb of God came to take away the sins of the world, and behold, the baby would be born. She will give birth to a son, and you shall cause, call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Why? Because it is those very sins that have separated you from God, those very sins that have hidden his face from you, and those very sins that keep him from hearing you. But the beautiful news is, now that those sins have been removed, now that that he nailed them to the cross and buried them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again, and your sins and your iniquities he will remember no more. Now that they've been dealt with, now that sin has been dealt with by our beautiful Savior Jesus, now we are no longer separated from God and never will be. Now his face will never be hidden from us, but he will reveal his face to us, and now he will hear us. He will not turn his ear away from us, but he will listen and he will hear and he will empathize and he will feel and he will love and he will and he will take care of you and he will listen to your prayers and he will respond to your cry and he will hear you in the midnight hour when you're lonely and he'll hear you in the darkest time when you're afraid and he'll hear you in your time of great pain and he'll hear, he'll hear you when you pray for your unsaved loved ones and he'll hear you when you need a miracle and he'll hear you when you need some breakthrough in your life. Why will he hear you? Because the only way to know why he'll hear you is to know why he won't hear you. And he won't hear you because your sins have separated you from him. But the blood of Jesus has washed away all of your sins. There's no more separation. There's no more separation. There's no more hiding. There's no more turning his face away. The Lamb of God the Father turned his face away from the Lamb of God one time when he said, when Jesus said, my God, my God. He never called him that before then. He always called him Father. He called him Father. He called him my Father. He called him Abba Father. And he called him our Father. But when he was on the cross, he called him God because he didn't feel like a son anymore. You know why? Because he became sin for us. So that we could feel like sons and we could feel like daughters. So that, and why did he feel like he wasn't a son anymore? Because the, fa the father turned his face away from Jesus so that he would never, ever turn his face away from you. And now his face is shining on you. And now the prayer of Moses from Exodus or Numbers chapter 6, where he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. And may his face shine upon you. That prayer didn't get fulfilled until that day on the cross. That prayer couldn't happen. God's face could not shine on people until his face hid from Jesus so that now his face will never again, ever again, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter where you've been, his face will never turn away 
from you. And his face is his favor. And his face is his grace. And his face is Jesus. And his face is healing. And his face is love. What made Matthew? What made Peter? What made these guys? It was, what made uh, Peter and Andrew, for example? What made them drop their nets when Jesus said, come follow, come follow me? And they dropped everything. They dropped their business. They dropped their nets. They dropped their relatives. They dropped their, they dropped their finance. They dropped everything and left everything immediately and followed Jesus. What made them do that? They saw his face. And when they saw his face, they felt his love. When they saw his face, they felt his mercy. When they saw his face, they were in love. If you can understand being in love from a, the point of view of a man to another man in that sense, we know what it is for a man to be in love with a woman, for a woman to be in love with a man. But this is any human being will fall in love with Jesus when they see his face. And when do we see his face? When we understand his grace. That he is not counting our trespasses against us. All right. Are we ready for number one? <laughs> we're going to go fast. I told you we're going to go fast. I'm like that dude in Talladega, Talladega Nights. I want to go fast. I want to go fast. <laughs> one person understands that. Got that. <laughs> God with us. Emmanuel. In Christ is a glorious reminder that God's willingness to clean things up is infinitely greater than our willingness to mess things up. The arrival of Jesus, the arrival of God in the flesh sets us free from the pressure to save ourselves from loneliness, rejection, fear, and despair. This is really important. You get this. The arrival of God in the flesh is it sets us free from the pressure we feel to save ourselves from loneliness. Why do people do what they do? Why do people do the wrong things they do? To save themselves from loneliness, to save themselves from rejection, to save themselves from fear, and to save themselves from despair. But the arrival of God in the flesh sets us free from that. He comes and his presence delivers us from loneliness. His presence delivers us from rejection. His presence delivers us from fear. And his presence delivers us from, dis from despair. Christmas is God's an answer to the slavery of self-salvation. Christmas is the answer to the slavery of self-salvation. And what that means is we, we, when we feel like we have to save ourselves, then we will be enslaved for the rest of our lives to trying to get ourselves saved and trying to get ourselves free. But Christmas is God's answer to the slavery of self-salvation. You don't have to save yourself. A, a child will be born or she gave birth to a, 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 to a son and his name shall be Jesus and he will save. He will save. He will save. He will save. He will save his people from their sins. You can't save yourself from your sins. He will save you from your sins because of his awesome grace. Christmas is Jesus coming to free us from the pressure of having to fix ourselves, find ourselves, and free ourselves. Listen, Christmas is Jesus coming. He comes to free us from the pressure of having to do three things, to fix ourselves, to find ourselves, and to free ourselves. We don't have to do any of those three things. Jesus, Jesus does them all. He fixes us when he comes. He finds us when he comes. We didn't find him, he found us. Don't go around saying, I found the Lord, you liar. You didn't find nothing. You can't find coins in, your, in the bottom of your couch. You didn't find no Lord. Come on. You can't find your cell phone sometimes. You can't find your keys sometimes. You didn't find the Lord. He found you. Come on, can anybody say amen to that? All right. Oh, you found the Lord. That's hilarious. Um, he sets us free from the pressure 
to fix ourselves, find ourselves, and free ourselves. He came to save us from the slavish need to be right, the slavish need to be regarded, the slavish need to be respected. We don't have to be regarded, respected, or right. He makes us right. He regards us. He respects us. We don't need man to feel we're right, to feel regarded, or to feel respected. He came to secure for us what we could not secure for ourselves. Life ceases to be lonely. Life ceases to be Life ceases to be lonely when we realize he's with us and this tireless effort to justify ourselves and validate ourselves is, is just where it wears you out. That's why I love O Holy Night because it's, it's, it's mercy and grace to the weary, right? It's finding hope and rest for the weary and Jesus is the one that said he'll give us rest. This is Christmas, this is grace. I, she shall bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus and he will save his people from their sins. Here are the miraculous benefits of forgiveness. Number one, and I mentioned it yesterday, forgiveness is the secret to happiness. Forgiveness is the secret to happiness. Um, Psalm 32 verse 1 in the JPS translation, our team might not even have this translation, but in the, in the uh, JPS translation in Psalm 32 1 it says, happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is pardoned. Happy is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is pardoned. In Romans chapter 4 verse 8, I love this verse. Again, I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation. Yes, what joy. Romans chapter 4 verse 8. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. You say, oh, I don't have a record. Oh, you have a record. All right. Oh, man, when a person who's been in prison gets their record cleared, that is freedom. That is liberty. That is they are, they are happy. If you if you have a, if you have a record, if you have something on your record, you probably won't be happy. But when you realize you had a record and and that record got cleared, that'll make you happy. And you say, oh, I don't have I don't have much of a record. Oh, yeah, you, you, you had some gold records, man. You had some you had some platinum records. Don't lie to God. You had some you had some records that sold so many copies. You had some records. You had so many records. But let me tell you, you had records that kept scratching. You had rec how many remember those old times when you'd play that record? And kept, I remember my Jackson five record. I remember my Jackson 5, I remember the one of the songs on the Jackson 5, one of the greatest hits, uh, um, and every time I remember it get to that one part, and every time it would skip, and I, I just learned that song skipping. I just learned that song that way. Got to be, 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 got to be. I put my finger on it. Got to be there. <laughs> We got so many scratches on our records. We, got, we keep skipping, or it keeps scratching, and we keep repeating the same mistakes. And that's why, thank God, once you realize that your record has been cleared, 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 has been cleared that's when happiness comes. That's when you become the happiest person on earth. The, who was the happiest person on earth? Jesus was. Why? He had no sin. And guess what? He took your sin. The only time he was a man of grief and sorrows is when he, and is when he, when he bore your sin and took it on the cross. And now, let's, let me tell you something. Let me tell you who you are now. You are now the same as Jesus was. Jesus was happy because he was without sin, and now as he is, so are we in this world, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. As he is, so are we in this world. So guess what that means? He was happy because he had no sin. Now you can be happy because you have no sin. Oh, yeah, no, but I sin. I do this. I do that. No, your sin's been washed away. I'm not denying. I'm not pretending that you don't do crappy stuff. But your sin, all of it, has been nailed to the cross and buried, it's gone. If you go back to it, that's, that's your business. That's on you, but it's still forgiven and you're still free from it. And as soon as you know that, you'll be happy. Happiness will come. That's the number one, that's the first miraculous benefit of forgiveness. It causes you to have joy, to be happy. Your record has been expunged, your record 
has been cleared. Why is this so important? Because unhappiness results in the high rates of negative health and depression and heart disease, strokes and sleeping disorders, stress, obesity, substance abuse, anger, and so much more. Individuals suffering from unhappiness are more likely to be unemployed. They're more likely to have bad relationships. They're more likely to have bad uh, marriages and homes. Recent study uh, from the University of Michigan showed that um, Facebook use makes people feel worse about themselves. Hi, everybody watching us on Facebook. <laughs> love, love you guys. Feel good about yourself because you're battling upstream right now just by being on Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> but truly, you can, use it, you can use it in a healthy way. You don't have to. But these are, the, these are the studies. These are the statistics. Using Facebook can reduce young adults' sense of well-being and satisfaction with life because they're checking it so much it makes them feel worse um, because they're comparing themselves with others and they feel like they're missing out. And, um, or it gives people a false sense of security because people like them so much. Like, 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 love. You know, like, 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 love. And then that makes you feel good about yourself. Wrong reason to feel good about yourself. Feel good about yourself because God likes you. God says about you, like, 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 love, 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 love. You know how those things go flying on your screen? Love, 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 like, 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 like. Does anybody even know what I'm talking about? Forget it. Number two, the second miracle of forgiveness is it leads to your inheritance and your blessing. Acts chapter 26, verse 17. Watch this. Acts chapter 26, verse 17. Jesus told Paul, he said, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Verse 18. He says, and to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance. He, this is what Jesus came to do. He came to bring us forgiveness of sins, and then the forgiveness of sins brings us into our inheritance. When you know you're forgiven, then you know that you are a recipient and you have the right to your inheritance. An unforgiven person does not have the right to God's inheritance. A forgiven person has the right to God's inheritance. Can anybody say, thank God for that? I don't have time to get into that, so we'll just go to number three. And you could just believe on these things and look these verses up and expect these things to show up in your life. It's the secret to healing. Forgiveness is the secret to healing. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus said to that man, he looked at the man that was paralyzed and he said, your son, your sins are forgiven. And they were like, well, who can forgive sins? And he said, just so you guys know that the son of God has power to forgive sins on earth. Then he said to the man, now take up your bed and walk and go home. And the man got up and he was healed. What did Jesus give him first? The man came for healing, but what did Jesus give him first? Forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness is the gateway to healing. If you can truly believe that God forgives you freely, then you will be able to believe that God can heal you freely. At least with sickness, you didn't do much to get it. Maybe some people did, but with most sickness, you didn't do anything to earn that sickness. But with sin, you did that. Yeah, you did that. Come on now. When it comes to our sins, we did do that. But he forgives us of, our, of all of our sins. So if he can forgive us of all of our sins that we did and we did deliberately, how much easier is it for him to heal us of something that we didn't even do deliberately? You didn't go... You, you didn't go, man, I'm going to go out and commit cancer. Man, I'm going to go out and commit heart disease. Man, I'm going to go out and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit some back pain. I, I can't wait. Man, I can't wait. I'm so mad at people. I'm going to commit some back pain. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit some shoulder pain. I'm going to commit some, I'm going to commit some arthritis. You know, I just feel, I, I feel dirty today. I'm just going to go out and commit arthritis. You don't commit any of that stuff. That happens to you, not by you. And yet, God, and if God forgives the things you deliberately did, which were your sins, he certainly will heal you of sin sickness and disease that you did nothing to bring upon yourself. Where are we? Are we what number are we on? What is it? You guys said different things. <laughs> number four, it, ex, uh, it makes you love. 
Forgiveness makes you love. The woman in Luke 7, 47, my favorite verse, one of my favorite verses, but I like it because it's it flies, man. Seven forty seven. Jesus said, therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. She's forgiven much. Therefore, she loves much. He said her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And as a result, she loved much. She didn't love much to get forgiven. She was forgiven of much. Therefore, she loved much. But you guys who have been forgiven little, none of us are forgiven of a little. But in their minds, they were forgiven a little. But in, she knew the reality of how much she was forgiven. And she who was forgiven much loved much. You know, if you have a deficit in love towards people, you don't have to try to become a better lover. You don't have to try to love more. You need to go back and realize how much more you've been forgiven than you have taken notice of. And the sooner you realize, because that'll deliver you from all the self-righteousness and religion, and it'll make you so thankful and so loving towards people. And if, if you know somebody who's mean, and if you've been mean, it's because they don't know how much they're forgiven. Because as soon as you know how much, forg how much you're forgiven, you're not mean anymore. I know in my life, my greatest seasons of anger were in this, it paralleled exactly to the greatest, the times where I forgot how much God had forgiven me of. What number are we on? It'll lower, forgiveness will lower your risk of substance abuse, whether it's alcohol, drugs, pornography, whatever it is, it will lower the risk. This is a big one because the biggest and best reason to jump into forgiveness and to realize how much God forgives you is because it delivers you from your need to heal your pain. Forgiveness heals your pain. God's forgiveness towards you heals your pain. And therefore, you don't need anything artificial to cover up your pain because receiving your forgiveness heals you of your pain. Number five or whatever. Number six. It strengthens your immune system. Dr. Carl Menninger, one of the world's most successful medical doctors and psychiatrists, did a study of the cure for mental illness. And at the end of his study, he said, I can take any patient who's mentally ill and I can rid them of 75% of all their mental illness with one word, forgive. Dr. Bernie Siegel, well-known writer, surgeon, and retired medical professor at Yale University said, I've collected 57 extremely well-documented so-called cancer miracles. At a certain particular moment in time, they decided that anger and the depression were probably not the best way to go since they had such little time left. So they went from that to being loving, caring, no longer angry, no longer depressed people and able to talk to people they loved. These 57 people had the same pattern. They gave up their anger totally. They gave up their depression totally by specifically deciding to f receive forgiveness and to give forgiveness. At that point, the tumors started to shrink 57 times. Come on, somebody's got to give God praise. <laughs> forgiveness frees us from being controlled by the choices other people make. Forgiveness frees us from being controlled by the choices other people make. Joseph said, am I in the place of God in Genesis 50, verse 19? Who, who, who are we to hold, a, hold something against someone that even God doesn't hold against them? And I just got to say this. Listen, this is really important. There's no need to hold a grudge against anyone who's hurt you because when you hold a grudge against people that hurt you, you're saying that that person has more power than God. But when you realize that God's power is able to turn the situation around, there's no more purpose for holding unforgiveness. We hold unforgiveness because we think that the person has control over us. We're mad at what they did because we think that what they did will stop the best life that we want. You no longer have to be under that control because when you forgive and when you trust that God has forgiven you and then you forgive others, and you're saying, you know what, whatever people, did, whatever people did to me, what God did for me is greater than what they did to me. I don't have time to dwell on that, maybe another time, but today is the day 
to give you the gift, to give yourself the gift of forgiveness. And the seventh one is it leads to promotion and purpose, which you can just study the life of Joseph. It leads to promotion and purpose. I'm going to ask our team to give people an opportunity to fill out your miracle prayer um, envelope now and to make your special miracle, Christmas miracle gift right now. Our team's going to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to wrap up the service and close out the service in a couple of moments. But um, I want to say a couple things about forgiving yourself because once you realize how much God has forgiven you, then you are able to forgive yourself. And I said this the other day, but I want to say it again. If you look in the mirror and you look at yourself in the eyes, but you don't like the person that you see, then you, there's one remedy for that, not surgery, not plastic surgery, not, you know, some sort of medical exam. If you don't like what you see when you look in the mirror, there's one thing you can do to cure that. Forgive yourself. Because what you're seeing is not your face. You're seeing your soul. And you feel unforgiveness. And you feel that you can't make up for what you've done. But you know what? The good news is you don't have to make up for what you've done. Jesus makes up for what you've done. Jesus already forgives you. When you look inside and you kick yourself over and over again for your past choices and mistakes, you still feel ashamed and guilty over your past and you're holding it against yourself, it's because you don't know who you really are in Christ. Jesus doesn't look at you that way. He doesn't remember your sins or iniquities, Hebrews 8, 12 tells us. He's forgotten them. They're gone. Even though the devil and the enemy tries to continually remind you of those things. I want to encourage you to forgive yourself.